So perfect. 13, 1400, let's start. Uh, so welcome back to our reinforcement learning course. Today we have lecture number 12, which is the deterministic policy gradient method lecture. So as the name already indicates, we are going to uh, extend, generalize to a certain extent what we have introduced last week with the gradient descent-based methods on policy learning on stochastic policies, today on deterministic policies. Therefore, uh, the lecture is basically structured into three parts. We will first discuss briefly on a general level the deterministic policy gradient uh, theorem. Uh, we will also do not go here into details in terms of the proof of the theorem, but discuss basically its implications. And then, based on that, uh, we are going to introduce two very uh, broadly used algorithms, specific algorithms, which make use out of the deterministic policy gradient method, which is DDPG, um, the deep deterministic policy gradient method, and TD3, which is a direct successor, twin delayed uh, deep deterministic policy gradient algorithms, which basically come with multiple tweaks and additions and practical extensions in contrast to this basic algorithm. Okay, so why do we discuss actually uh, the deterministic policy gradient methods? So from last week, we have basically seen that uh, we can utilize policy gradient methods to directly try to train a policy which directly maps states to actions, and we have seen that with the stochastic policy gradient theorem, that was successful for stochastic policies. However, uh, in many um, situations, we uh, do not want to stick to this on-policy algorithms, which we have seen, for example, due to learning efficiency. What do I mean with that is that last week we had looked at algorithms, which just take one data sample, right? So we apply an action, we get a reward, and we get a state uh, transition. We take the single data snippet, propagate it to our algorithm, obtain a new actor, obtain a new critic, obtain a new policy, and then, as we have learned on policy, we basically needed to discard this data sample because it was basically um, based on a previous policy, which has now updated, which is now not available anymore, and therefore we could not reutilize this data snippet, and therefore it is very data inefficient because we just see every data snippet just once, and then afterwards need to discard it. So therefore, this on-policy learning, which we have seen in the stochastic policy gradient theorem algorithms from last week, are normally considered data inefficient learning. Uh, what next also is that exploration, of course, is uh, a topic which might be interesting in that sense that um, last week we had introduced these um, stochastic policies, basically meaning that Our action was always, so mu or pi of x, that this was always some kind of um, policy distribution. So if we are in a certain state x and we are looking for the action which is taking next, that was basically just drawn from a random distribution, and that normally means that we do not have a direct access to the exploration in that sense that we say, okay, at a certain time step, I would like to try out this specific action to see if that's maybe better or worse than others, mm -hmm. but I just need to draw from this random distribution, and then I do not have direct control of what is happening next. And with the deterministic approaches today, what we can basically do is we can have a deterministic policy, so where this is not a random distribution from which we take a realization, but we just have a deterministic mapping from a policy to states. And what we can do then is on top of this deterministic decision-making policies, we can have an exploration algorithm which we can tune on our own. So the behavior policy, which will basically do ex, uh, exploration in the off-policy sense, can be then tuned by ourselves, and we can uh, 
uh, come up with more um, exploration strategies than just throwing random numbers. Also here with these random policies or probabilistic policies, of course, what will be also the case is that this, um, let's say, variance in terms of this Gaussian distribution here will be always greater than zero. So that means that even if the learning process has more or less come to an end, there will be still always some stochastic uh, influences and therefore we will normally come not, come not up with the best po uh, policies in deterministic environments. So therefore, our alternatives, I've already mentioned them briefly. What we're going to discuss today is we are going to look into a deterministic policy with a separate exploration. So we basically split up the two parts and we are going to go back, at least in the second step, um, to off-policy learning. Uh, off-policy learning, we have that, for example, with the normal Q-learning or deep Q-learning networks, uh, where we can utilize a memory replay buffer to store memory tuples. And as we do off-policy learning, that means that we can reutilize these data tuples more than once, which is considered data efficient or more data efficient than on policy learning, where we can just reutilize the data sample only once. And therefore, what we are going to focus today is basically that, in contrast to last week, we are basically having now a policy pie, which is still mapping states to actions. But what we do is we basically just take this deterministic part, which last week we had introduced with mu, which was basically this average over the distribution. And since we're now considering a deterministic policy, we just need this average information without any additional information about the variance or any other kinds of parameters describing a, probabili a probabilistic um, distribution. Okay. So basically, maybe I can also sketch that from this probabilistic distribution, we then basically go so that was mu, that was our Zygmar, and what we are going to do today is basically that we just go to a deterministic policy where our mu of x basically just gives us a very straight value, a very straight action, which uh, is not random or any kind of probabilistic information. So with this deterministic policies, uh, we basically then also need to reconsider our, um, determ our policy gradient theorem, because um, if that is a deterministic function, then basically the likelihood to do a certain action is always one, and that is a problem with the stochastic policy gradient theorem from last week. And if we redo the entire derivation of uh, the policy gradient theorem for a deterministic policy, then we will actually find out that the deterministic policy gradient theorem looks a little bit different in the deterministic case. Familiar but different. The familiar part is basically this part. So we basically need to calculate the gradient of our deterministic policy mu with respect to the parameters of this gradient. So that is the part which we already had also last week where we needed to calculate the gradient of the stochastic policy. This is now the gradient of the deterministic policy, so basically more or less the same. This will be some mathematical function, an artificial neural network, or a polynomial, or whatsoever, with some parameters, and we just need to calculate the gradient with respect to the parameters. So that's not so complicated. And what is basically now different is that second part here, we calculate the gradient with respect to the Q values with respect to the actions. So how can we interpret then this multiplications out of these two gradients? The interpretation would be, of course, let's try to change the parameters of our policy in this way, in this way where we expect that changing our actions will lead to higher Q values, right? Change the parameters of the policy in the direction of actions which will increase our Q values and therefore increase our decision-making performance. 
If we have a closer look at this policy gradient theorem, this, of course, is, a, uh, as I said, a function which we can basically program beforehand. We need to define our policy as a mathematical function. So that's our task as a control engineers. And therefore, we can also calculate the gradient. Um, the Q values here, of course, that is then something else. Uh, no, normally, nobody will give you the exact Q values for a given policy beforehand. So that means that we need to estimate the Q values and the gradient of the Q values with respect to that action based on data which we have received from the environment. And that basically motivates to have, again, a critic network, which is basically approximating this Q values. And then if you have a critic, which is, again, a mathematical function, for example, an artificial neural network, we can just, again, calculate the first order derivative here. Yes. No, yeah, we need the expectation, of course, with respect to the Q values, right? So the, 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 the Yeah, so the mu, of course, mu is our policy, which is deterministic and somehow given for the moment. But the Q values, of course, could be uh, stochastic values with respect to the MDP, which we are operating in, right? So the policy can be deterministic or will be deterministic. So that's our key assumption for today. But the environment, the MDP or problem, that is still potentially a stochastic environment, right? So that's why we need the expectation over the, uh, given the policy in an unknown MDP, right? And in practice, of course, that means that this Q part here, giving some data samples, will be just approximated and estimated using, again, our normal Q value estimator approaches. Okay, but good question. So expectation due to the stochastic influences of the, or potentially stochastic influences of the environment. Okay, so I've basically said that Q needs to be approximated, for example, using TD0 and approximation approaches like artificial neural networks. And um, this entire policy gradient theorem here is also basically valid in the off policy case. So that's a nice thing. Uh, with respect to the on policy case from last week, that one can basically show that the deterministic policy gradient theorem is applicable in both on policy and off policy learning. And due to save time and do not go to very lengthy derivations of mathematical formulas, we will, as I said, do not go here through the proof uh, in the lecture. But if you like, uh, the original paper from David Silver is linked here as a um, electronic link in the PDF. So you can just review the um, proof by yourself if you like. Um, and yeah, it's a paper which is free of charge and uh, available from outside. Okay. Um, good. So if we change our policy from a stochastic policy where exploration is part of the policy, to a deterministic policy where the exploration is separate from the policy making decisions, we should have a brief discussion how we can basically add uh, exploration actions, exploration decisions to our policy in this case. Right, so um, as I've said, if we have a deterministic policy, uh, we need to learn something. Um, and for this, we can basically discuss different options. The first option is, of course, that we either assume that the environment is also noisy or random in that sense that, for example, um, you want to fly to a, a helicopter and let's say that you are operating this helicopter in a windy environment and that from time to time you basically get like winds from all sides of that helicopter, which could be translated into actions to steer this helicopter, like you want to increase thrust or you want to steer right, left and whatsoever. So these noisy impacts, these random impacts of the environment would basically help you in order to learn something about how to steer this helicopter. Of course, this approach would be somehow naive because normally in most realistic environments, you will not have these random impacts, which will be so optimistic and so positive in that sense that it really help you to learn something. 
So what can you else do? You can, of course, again, add noise to the actions and basically making it an off-policy approach. And that could be, for example, a so-called ornstein uhlenbeck noise or also a Wiener noise process or whatsoever. The ornstein uhlenbeck noise, I'm just mentioning it here because the ornstein uhlenbeck noise process is a very classical noise process which is associated with deterministic um, policy-making approaches. What is an ornstein uhlenbeck noise? So an ornstein uhlenbeck noise is basically a deterministic uh, not deterministic, but a dynamic noise process. So nu k plus 1, that would be the noise output at time step k plus 1, is equal to lambda times nu k plus sigma times epsilon k. Epsilon k would be a uh, Gaussian standard sequence, so that would be basically uh, a random numbers drawn from the normal distributions, which are scaled by this factor sigma, so basically that would be like a noise the noise amplification gain in simplified words, if you like to say that. And this part here, this nu k plus 1 is lambda times nu k, this of course hopefully remembers you at the basics of system theory or control engineering, this looks like a low-pass filter, right? So basically what we have here is a low-pass filter dynamic variant of a random process. So how would that look like? Let's have a cartoonic sketch. So that would be k over time. That would be, let's say, epsilon and nu. So epsilon would be like a random noise drawn from the random numbers of a Gaussian distribution. Could be something like this in the discrete time domain. Um, the important things are here that the signal can, so that would be basically my epsilon, the uh, random number sequence from the uh, normal distribution can in every time jump as much as it like, and also in average this signal would be basically zero. And the einstein uhlenbeck noise would be a low-pass filtered variant out of it. And so on. Um, so the base thing is that here the frequency domain is a little bit shifted, but also what the einstein uhlenbeck noise allows us due to the filtering is that parts of the model, for example this part here, can be uh, a longer time in the positive or negative part of the uh, sequence and therefore the einstein uhlenbeck noise is normally not always zero over shorter time amounts, but it can be above or below zero uh, or sequence here and therefore allows us to add noise to or exploration noise to the system which is um, having another frequency shape and is also not always zero. So for example if um, you want to learn how to drive a car and your exploration noise would be just uh, a Gaussian sequence with mere zero mean and let's say that your action is basically your acceleration pedal, your, um, your yeah, acceleration pedal, then of course if that is jumping let's say between positive and negative numbers all the time, that would be basically accelerate, break, accelerate, break. So from this kind of accelerating, breaking sequences, it is maybe not so likely that you learn so much. With the einstein uhlenbeck noise, which will shape basically this a little bit more, you will have longer sequences where you accelerate with positive acceleration force, and then you will also have a longer sequence where you will learn how to break with negative braking forces over a longer time. So therefore, this einstein uhlenbeck noise is normally something which delivers you a better kind of 
exploration behavior. However, the key point which I wanted to make up with the slide is that if we utilize the deterministic policy gradient approach in the off policy case, we can shape this exploration noise or exploration actions as we like. The Ornstein Uhlenbeck process is just a very common process, but you can also define a behavior policy uh, for exploration as you like. So if you have a model of your plant or if you have some expert pre knowledge about the plant, you can come up with uh, application specific exploration strategies as you like, and that's a big advantage or a degree of flexibility over these stochastic policies where you can basically uh, yeah, do not really steer the exploration by yourself. Okay. With these deterministic policy gradients, we can basically change the actor critic approach, which we had last week already for stochastic policies now into the deterministic case. If you look at the pseudo code, we can basically see that the actor critic approach with a deterministic policy is more or less similar, very similar to the stochastic case. We need a policy function, which is of course now a deterministic policy, not a stochastic policy. We need a function approximator for the Q values. Last week we had approximated the V values. Now we work with the Q values, which is more or less the uh, same approach. We need some parameters for step sizing. We need some parameters in terms of setting up our function approximator weights for mu and q. And then over different episodes, what we're going to do is we draw actions from our policy mu, potentially with some additional noise or even completely uh, in an off policy way using a behavior policy. We observe the action response of the plant. We choose the successor state from our deterministic policy. With this successor state from a deterministic policy, we can calculate the Zaza zero or TD zero error. With this TD zero error, we can calculate our gradient descent on the critic. And lastly, we can utilize this new deterministic policy gradient theorem in order to update our parameters tether of the policy making actor. And basically, if you compare this algorithm to our actor critic approach from last week, you will basically just see that this line with the new policy gradient theorem and this line in terms of how we get our actions, these are basically the only real changes and the rest of the algorithm is pretty much the same. Here in this little example, I've uh, given you uh, basically three algorithms from a paper here uh, from David Silver, uh, where we basically took three algorithms for the uh, COPDACQ algorithm. That would be basically the algorithm which we have just seen on the previous slide, a deterministic off-policy actor-critic approach. And the SAC and OFFPAC are basically on policy actor critic approaches and off policy actor critic approaches from the stochastic case. And what we can see here in these three examples a mountain car example and the pendulum example I think these two examples you already had briefly in the exercises, so the environments should be known. This is how we get with a car out of a mountain valley, how to stabilize the pendulum. And 2D puddle world is basically also just another mock-up example here. But the baseline information is here that in these, let's say, robotic-oriented, control-oriented tasks, so uh, tasks which normally will have an optimal policy which are deterministic, that these deterministic off-policy approaches, which we have just introduced, can basically learn quicker and that they are also able to reach in average, even over longer time spans, a better uh, performance since we can basically schedule here also the exploration, right? Maybe I go back here. So what we can do here very nicely is that also at the beginning of an episode, for example, we can scale the sigma in such a way that we will have a lot of noise at the beginning, so basically favor exploration, and then over time, when we find out that exploration was already sufficient, we can reduce sigma 
and play around with the other parameters such that the exploration noise gets reduced and reduced and reduced such that the actual actions which we apply to our uh, environment become more and more deterministic, which would be then optimal in sense of these robotic control-oriented uh, problems. Okay. If we compare this algorithm with our algorithm from last week, we basically so far have just uh, one major, major change. And this one major change is that we will have um, this off-policy approach using a deterministic policy. However, what is still here the case is that per time step, we just evaluate the sample, the data sample, so this one here, which we observe from the policy and the plant, that we utilize this data sample just once. So that means we observe the data sample, propagate it through our learning process, and then the data sample is discarded again. So we just utilize it once, not multiple times. And over the time, one have found out in the, in the research literature of reinforcement learning that this is not really efficient because uh, this is basically a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So that means we can reutilize actually the data samples multiple times in order to get more information out of the data samples and therefore to increase the learning process without needing so much data samples in total. Therefore, this deterministic policy gradient approach was extended over time with different tweaks in order to make it more efficient and to increase the learning speed and to come up with better results over this classical approach of our actor critic where we do not utilize these tweaks. And basically what I would like to uh, go with you now are two algorithm classes which are built on top of the deterministic policy gradient theorem, which is the DD DDPG and then the TD3. And actually both of them are very much related to each other, um, but we will see basically that um, they yeah, are step-like improvements over the standard algorithm here. So, the DDPG, our first algorithm, which I would like to um, discuss with you, is basically built upon the success of the DQN, which we have already seen two weeks ago. So the deep Q networks, where we basically had this one large network, which was uh, estimating, which were approximating the Q values, and where we had uh, assumed a static, uh, a discrete action set, which uh, the DQN approach was feasible with. The important observation here was that the DQN approach was super sample efficient and was also able to apply on complex problems like these Atari problems. And the idea was now with the DDPG to apply the successes of the DQN approach also to continuous problems like um, the deterministic policy gradient approach. And that's where the DDPG comes from. Um, of course, yeah, in the DQN case, of course, we cannot really utilize uh, the DQN approach for continuous problems. Why? Now, yeah, in the um, Q learning problem, we would basically need to find out the max of the Q values over the actions. This is, of course, only feasible if the actions are a limited number of discrete actions, so that this is maybe like two, three, four, five, or what's many actions that they can basically just compare them one by one and make a decision. But if uh, basically my actions would be a continuous variable or maybe multiple continuous variables, this max over Q would become an own optimization problem, right? So this would be some cost function or Q value function, like some landscape and you would need to plug in an optimization solver like another gradient descent solver or some meta heuristic solver or whatsoever to evaluate this landscape and find a continuous U, which could be one dimensional or multi dimensional, maximizing this Q value estimator. And that is something which we do not normally like because this will lead to additional computational demand and will be especially problematic. 
if you want to utilize this technique in uh, real-world scenarios where decision-making has to be quick, because in this case, uh, if the decision-making needs to be quick, to throw in another optimizer here each time you want to make a decision is, um, takes time, and especially in applications where you have just very little time to make a decision. For example, in motorsports where you want to steer a car very fast through the curve, normally the drivers just have uh, milliseconds to make reasonable decisions. And every time, uh, let's say if you have an autonomous car, if this autonomous car should make a decision what to do, how to operate inside the streets, you do not want to have such a um, computational heavy operation here. And the idea is basically now, okay, if Q-learning was so successful with discrete actions in the DQN case, and we do not want to do this explicit optimization over the Q-values in the continuous action case, the question was basically how can we come together? How can we combine Q-learning with continuous actions? And the nice thing is that in the deterministic case, that is actually quite easily possible to do that because if we have a deterministic policy and we assume that this deterministic policy is a good approximation of an optimal policy, right? So somebody told you or you have learned over time how to steer this racing car in an optimal way with respect to speed and time in order to do a track race, then of course, the maximization of the Q values over the action would be the same as using our Q values and plug in the action which we receive from the policy, right? Here, that was our Q learning problem. Let's find the Q value fitting to the action which has the highest Q value. So that would be an optimization problem. But if we have a deterministic policy, this deterministic policy will basically tell us if this is the state X, so you're in the car and this is the driving scenario, this is the decision you should make in order to make an optimal next step, right? And therefore, if that is the optimal policy, we can plug it in here and we'll get the Q value which can lead or which will lead to the highest possible value. And that's a very nice thing about the deterministic policies in contrast to the stochastic policies from last week, right? Because in the stochastic policy case, if we would plug in a stochastic policy here, that would basically mean, okay, we ask our policy and with a certain variance, we will draw some random action out of this policy distribution. So that means that we do not have any guarantee that even if that is an optimal policy in terms of the deterministic part, that the actual action I've drawn from this random policy would be the real best action in this time. And now with the deterministic policies, that is not the case anymore. And we can assume, uh, or can hope at least, that if we have learned the policy sufficiently well, that this is the optimal action. And therefore, this deterministic policy trick basically helps us to get rid out of this optimization problem. And yeah, for the improving the deterministic policy, of course, over time, we can just utilize our policy gradient theorem, which we have just introduced in the previous subsection, and basically can find an algorithm which uses Q learning. So that would be the Q learning part and policy gradient optimization over time using the DPG part. That are basically the two things which we plug together. DPG part, so deterministic policy gradient theorem part, and Q-learning from DQN. Therefore, long story short, DDPG is basically DQM plus DPG, so deep Q learning networks, Q learning plus a deterministic policy gradient such that we can get an actor-critic approach, which is off-policy capable, so we do not need to learn on the same policy, which we are 
uh, exploring with and that it is capable of continuous state and action space. Of course, these networks which will approximate the queue parts and the policy parts can be uh, any functions and can therefore work on continuous problem spaces. However, we will again also introduce some tweaks. So with tweaks, I mean like practical tweaks, which are uh, basically motivated based on empirical observations and not so much on based on mathematical, mathematical derivations, but on empirical observations that these tweaks will basically help in order to get the DDPG more stable and also more speedy in terms of learning. And you will see that these tweaks are basically more or less uh, not the same, but very similar to the tweaks which we have already introduced in the DQN case. The first tweak is that we will basically use an experience replay buffer, because we are now able of using off policy, so that means that all the data samples which we get, so states, state transition, action and reward, so that is a data sample, that these data samples are put into a memory buffer, and this memory buffer can then be used over time to learn uh, the Q values and improve the policy. And in order to learn the critic, which we need for obvious reasons for the um, deterministic policy gradient theorem, can be then again learned in this supervised machine learning way, right? So we can basically define a cost function with the Bellman equation. So this is basically here the left-hand side of the Bellman equation, that is the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. Normally between left and right-hand side of the Bellman equation, we would put an identity so an equal. And during the learning process, the left and the right-hand side of the Bellman equation might not be correct, and therefore we can guide our critic, our Q value approximator, by this mu squared Bellman error, in order to learn how to approximate the Q values more accurately. And that's a nice thing. So instead of using just a standard gradient descent algorithm on the Q value approximator, we can basically now use batches or mini batches in a supervised machine learning way in order to learn how to get the Q values out of data samples. Exactly the same approach as in the um, DQN case. Now the big difference is that for the optimal actions, we need to plug in our deterministic policy here, and we will basically have continuous actions. Second tweak is something which you also already know, target networks. Are, does somebody know, does it stay here? Why we had these target networks in the DQN case? So what was our motivation for the target networks in DQN? Target networks were this cloning of the critics. So we basically had like two critics. Why did we invest the effort to have two critics and not only one? Yeah. Yeah, the advantage function can have something to do with that, but what specifically? So, I mean, the advantage can be also just calculated with a single critic, right? So why do we need two of them? Um, yes, that would be also possible, um, but of course, if I go back to this, um, of course I can update the critic based on this loss function, this cost function also every five times or every ten times, right? For that I would also, you don't need two critics, right? So what is the motivation to have two critics then with these target networks? Not with the own policy, but with the own Q value estimate. 
They're not actions, but Q values, right? So here in the loss function, we basically have two times the Q value here for the successor state and the successor action, here for the current state and the current action. And if I would just have two critics, uh, sorry, only one critic, then this left-hand side, the so-called target, right? So this parenthesis here would be the target. And my estimator, I want to learn, I want to train over time, these would be the same function, right? So the function I learn, I update, would be dependent on itself, right? And that can be numerically risky, numerically unstable. And therefore, what we do is that for this left-hand side here, for the target part of the loss function, we introduce this delayed version of Q such that the target part of Q and the, the non-target part, so the function approximator I want to learn, I want to update over time, that these two become partially independent, or at least delayed, such that the learning over this loss function becomes numerically more stable. So that was the motivation that we do not want to have the Q, the same identical Q function two times in this loss function. So that's why we introduce um, target functions. Um, however, maybe that's also important, we actually need to introduce two target networks. One target network for the Q value here, for obvious reasons, but also now we need a second target network for um, the policy, because the policy information, of course, needs to be plugged into the Q value target calculation here. So that's why we need a target network, a delayed target network for Q and a delayed target network for mu to stabilize basically this information here on the left hand side. So that's why we work with W minus, which is a delayed version of our critic weights. And we have theta minus, which is a delayed version of our policy weights. Theta policy weights, theta minus a delayed version, W critic weights, and W minus the delayed critic weights. Here in this variant of the target networks, that's basically from the original DDPG paper, um, we are using a little different kind of updating mechanisms of the target networks. For the original DQN case, we basically had step-like changes. So we waited, let's say, 10 time steps and then completely cloned our critic and updated our target network, let's say, every 10 or 100 steps. But when we updated it, we took the entire critic network and updated the target network of the critic in one shot completely uh, straight. In the DDPG case, what was recommended here was not to have these kinds of um, full updates, step-like updates, but to basically have smooth updates in a low-pass filter way. So here again, you see this low-pass filter characteristic with 1 minus tau, tau something like a time constant. Here's a tau as well. So basically, what will happen here in these update equations is that, depending on how we define tau, that over time, if w changes, W minus will follow W and theta minus will follow theta, but with a certain time delay. But this will be a continuous time delay. It will not be like step-like, so we update everything at once, but we will update it with a certain delay and therefore try to stabilize the learning process here. So low-pass filter uh, approach at that point. And these low-pass filter constants, so the taus, that would be basically the so-called hyperparameter of the algorithm, which will basically mean if tau uh, becomes a very um, high value in this case, that would mean that we will uh, update quite quickly. If tau becomes uh, a lower number, close to zero, then this would basically mean that we update very slowly and therefore um, 
the delay between the target networks and the actual networks will be great. Okay, so second tweak, target networks in order to make this loss function, the target independent here from the actual estimator. And last but not least, no, not last but not least, but pre-least, uh, mini batches. So that is also something which we have already introduced in the DQN case. If our um, memory buffer D, our experience replay buffer, that can have thousands or maybe even millions of data samples. So that is also a hyperparameter. I can make this memory buffer very large. So I can put there like millions or 10 of millions data samples in. Or I can make this data buffer very small, maybe just a thousand uh, of data samples. This really depends on your task, on your computational uh, resources. If you have an embedded system with just a very small microcontroller with a little bit of uh, memory, uh, then of course the D would be very small. If you have a very large workstation or something, then of course you have more potential to make the memory buffer larger. In any case, normally what we will do is in this gradient descent, a stochastic gradient descent manner, we will just draw mini batches from this data buffer because we normally consider D to be quite large and with this mini batches we can basically draw batches out of the full memory buffer which fit more to our hardware which we have, right? So uh, let's say you have a very weak CPU or something, microprocessor, then maybe the mini batches, just like 16 or 32 data samples which you draw from your memory buffer and then you can propagate this low amount of data through your networks, through your uh, loss optimization solver, whatever you apply here, and that can be then done in a small amount of time. If you have a very, I don't know, large GPU or something, then you can take more memory um, cells at once and propagate more over them through the loss function. Yeah, batch normalization, that is actually uh, the last and fourth tweak of, uh, not the last, but the fourth tweak of the um, DDPG. What is batch normalization? Batch normalization is normally that if you have a neural network, that over the different layers of the neural network, you just normalize the data which is propagated to every layer independently. That was actually the original um, proposal by Lillycrab on the original DDPG paper. However, my today's perspective of that would be that this loss function is a standard supervised machine learning task, right? So if we have our target networks here and we want to update Q over time, making Q more accurate over time, this is just a standard supervised machine learning problem. So that means if you want to solve this problem with respect to the critic Q, just take the most recently available supervised machine learning algorithms which you can get from standard toolboxes because normally uh, out there are many open source um, toolboxes which are very well maintained, which have the newest tweaks and uh, tricks applicable to supervised machine learning like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And if you feed in this loss function to any of these um, toolboxes like TensorFlow or PyTorch and just use the standard solver configuration, use the best possible stuff which is in the toolbox, you normally will ensure that this learning of the Q value will be accessed quite good. Exploration, that was another tweak uh, in the paper. Um, the paper actually from Lillycrab, the or original DDPG paper, uh, proposed the onstein uhlenberg process, which we had uh, previously approached uh, on the exploration discussion. However, um, as I've already mentioned, the onstein uhlenberg noise here is just a possible exploration noise, which you can add up to your deterministic action that you add up this exploration noise on it. But of course, it's not the only uh, possible approach. You can also add model-based or expert-based exploration guidance if you like to do so. So, many tweaks, but if we come together in a very bird's eye perspective on the DDP, 
DDPG structure, I find that the algorithm is quite intuitive and quite easy, actually. So what do we have here? We have our standard learning loop of reinforcement learning with rewards, observables, actions, and states. And inside our reinforcement learning agent, we basically have this large memory buffer where we store more or less everything which we have received out of this learning loop here. Of course, if the memory is full, then you might have like a ring buffer or something and just discard the oldest values out of the memory. And then here we have our standard actor critic structure from last week already, but we use the two um, target networks, W minus and theta minus, as a delayed version of the actor, as a delayed version of the critic in order to stabilize the learning of the critic. And then based on what we have seen so far, we need the target networks in order to update the critic with our supervised machine learning loss function based on the Bellman error. And then with the critic, we can calculate the gradient of the Q values with respect to the actions and apply the deterministic policy gradient theorem on the actor and can also improve the actor over time. And in order to learn something over time, we add noise to our deterministic actions, which could be in random noise like Ornstein Uhlenbeck or exploration, which is then guided by some expert or by some model information you have available. So basically, very simple, and I would say also very intuitive in that sense that um, we have this actor-critic approach. So actor-critic, I feel, in reinforcement learning is always very intuitive in that sense that somebody tells you what is good or bad, so that would be the critic, and the actor is basically just your, your brain which makes the decisions, so uh, that's uh, a direct translation. And we have also now in this DDPG form the differentiation, the difference between what we think is the best possible action at the current point of time, so our deterministic actions, and an add-on with respect to expiration, so that we think, okay, maybe this is optimal, but I'm not so sure yet, so let's add an additional, maybe risky step on it, to try out something new and then see over time if this new explorative action step was better or worse than our previous policy. So actually very intuitive and very strongly attached to how I at least uh, would consider how humans also learn so that we learn from experience that we have like an inner voice what we think in the past was good or bad that we have like an intuition in our brain what to do next and that we can also reconsider about decisions if these decisions are still optimal or if I need to do something uh, else if I need to explore. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's an actually a very good question. We will come to back to it in the TD3 algorithm, which we will see just next. Here in the DDPG algorithm, it is actually just the actions which really go to the environment. So the only part where we add explorative noise here would be on top of the real actions which we apply to our environment. Because we are operating in an unknown environment, right? So in an unknown environment, you would actually need to experience, you would need to observe how this manipulated action would result in certain state responses, right? You do not have them in this DDPG algorithm, assuming that this is a model-free algorithm, you do not know how the 
plant, our environment will react if we add certain noise on our actions. Or actually, you do not know how the environment will react on any action, right? So it's a model free algorithm. So therefore, this noise needs to be added to the real no to the real actions, and then observe the state response of the real system. Yes. Yes. So what you actually um, save is this U, which is I think we also had it here, which is the superposition of our deterministic policy part plus the noise or any kind of explorative manipulation. Actually, actually yes. So the U here would be deterministic part plus noise, and this is what is stored in the memory buffer. Right, because, um, I don't know, let's say you again want to learn driving, and your deterministic uh, policy choice would be in a certain driving situation to do nothing. So you do not accelerate, you do not brake, neutral input, nothing. But then, you add some exploration noise to it, would be, would, which would be like plus 50% like out of the maximum acceleration from your acceleration pedal. And of course, um, if you then apply this 50% acceleration pedal to your environment, so through your car dynamics, this will lead to an acceleration of the car. So you will see that, for example, the speed of the car is an important part of the state space that very likely the speed will increase, right? So that would only make a consistent observation if this U, which is saved up here in the memory buffer, is the total action. So deterministic part plus noise part, because otherwise you would have an observation, you did nothing, deterministic part, and you accelerated. Which could be the case if you, you know, drive down a hill, but let's assume you're like in the normal, so no incline of the road, flat surface, and in this case, it wouldn't make any sense. So that needs to be consistent, and therefore, you always the combination of the two. Or any other kind of behavior policy, right? So this is off policy learning. So this noise here, so that's why also the noise is more or less like in a, in a dashed uh, box here. So we could exchange this noise against other things. So that doesn't need to be noise. It can be also completely a trainer, right? So coming back to my car example, your actions could be here completely over manipulated by a, a trainer, so by a driving trainer, which says, okay, in this situation, please accelerate, or in this situation, please brake, because otherwise things get risky or whatsoever. And since this is off policy, we can learn from that. That's a nice thing. Other questions to this? Yeah. To the structure. If it would be off policy, we would need to have some stochastic policy, right? So we draw from random probability distributions, and a trainer would be always something which would be part of an off policy learning algorithm because the trainer is not part of your own policy, right? The trainer will have. So the, the probability distribution of taking certain actions given a state of the trainer will be different from your own probability distribution taking actions given a state. So that's why two different policies, the behavior policy of the trainer and your policy as you learn something, that does not fit together, so that cannot be on policy. It would be always off policy. Yeah. Yes, so that's actually a very good comment. So um, that would be called like imitation learning normally, um, if you look into the literature. So what we can do, for example, if you have data sitting somewhere. Um, so for example, you had maybe um, driving lessons 
which has been monitored from many different driving students, um, how they have to learn to drive a car, you could put these, this data, so state, state transition actions and rewards of them as a warm start, so to speak, into the memory buffer. And then you can play around with this learning loop. So learning the Q values based on the Bellman errors, using the critic to improve the policy over time, to learn something out of this memory buffer without or before taking the own first action. So that's a nice thing of, of policy learning here, DTBG in, 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 in particular. And what you normally will do as the name imitation learning already says, you will norm, normally will learn about the policy which is um, mapped or which has been used in order to generate this data. So that means if this was a bunch of very bad driving students, you will see that the critic will basically tell you the Q values are very low, performance is bad, but you will also be not better than learning a policy which basically is reflected by this data. So you will learn how to drive a car badly. Maybe learn to drive it, but not good. And so this imitation learning, filling up the memory buffer based on some pre-knowledge or pre-data you have, can be a good baseline. But then based on that, you should then also activate the entire learning loop, taking additional actions, adding exploration to these actions, and then see if you can do better, right? But very good comment, yeah, DDPG could be used for imitation learning as also every other off-policy algorithm. So also the DQM from two weeks ago, which also had this memory buffer, could be used in order to do imitation learning. Okay, let's finish up with the DDPG uh, with the pseudocode, uh, just to go through it once by once. So what do we need? We basically need two functions, the policy function and the action value function for mu and q. So that would be typically artificial neural networks or any other kind of functions like polynomials, for example. Um, of course, at this point, you can also do many things right or wrong. Um, so for example, Let's say uh, we go back to our driving example. Um, one action is the acceleration pedal and let's say, and the braking pedal together. So let's say in this uh, action space in terms of acceleration, you can um, choose actions between one and minus one. One would be like full acceleration and minus one would be full braking. Um, if that is your action space. What could go wrong, for example, then is that you define an artificial neural network, mu or mu hat or whatsoever, and at the output layer, so so we have some artificial neural network with some layers, doesn't matter. So that would be mu of x comma tether. Here we have the summation, and then here we would have our activation function with our U coming out of that. And then here would come something like that. So I've said our action space should be between one and minus one. And what you could do then, for example, is here as an activation function, have something like this, a reload, a rectified linear unit. In this case, the output of this activation function would be always positive, right? Whatever here in this artificial neural network parts is happening, whatever comes in here, due to this form of your choice of this activation function, a rectified unit, 
this can only have positive values. So that would be a very bad choice if you want to learn about a policy which is able to utilize the entire spectrum of actions from one to minus one, right? So it's, of course, a, it's a made up issue, but uh, just to give you some yeah, more or less practical example that in this design question, how to design, for example, our actor network, you can do many things wrong. So you really need to make up your mind at this very stage, at the very first stage of the DDPG implementation, how should I design the structure, not the parameters, but the structure of these functions such that they fit to my problem, right? Same issue can be happening with the queue values. Let's say you have a reward design um, which has only negative values. So your agent is just getting punished and in the best case it gets like zero rewards. If your rewards are negative, your Q value will be negatives, right? And if you come up with a critic, which also at the output layer has a reload, then your critic output can be just a positive Q value, so that does not fit to the Q values of your problem. So you have a structural problem and learning will be negatively impacted. So you really need to make up your mind that you define these policy functions and action value functions such that they fit to your application. So then we have some initializations um, of the weights, for example, here of the actor uh, of the critic weights and the target weights of the critic. Same for the actor, and we have some parameters, the step sizes and filter constants, which we need to set up. Then, over different episodes, we initialize our environment, and over one episode, we take actions from our deterministic policy, or potentially a behavior policy. Since it's off-learning, we observe the response of the system, and we store this experience tuple in our memory buffer. From the memory buffer, of course, after it has been filled sufficiently well, Right, so let's say this many batch has a mini batch size of 16, and you want to draw a mini batch out of this memory buffer. Of course, you should wait for the first 16 iterations such that this memory buffer is filled up, that you get at least a full mini batch, so a full sized mini batch. Then from this mini batch, we can calculate our targets. So this yi is the right hand or the left hand side of our Bellman equation, reward plus discounted Q value of the successor state and successor action. We calculate this here with the target networks. And then we fit our critic. Here we fit our critic based on the targets, which we have calculated before based on the target networks. For this, we would utilize any standard machine learning toolbox, TensorFlow PyTorch as the usual ones, for example. And then when we have fitted our, or improved the fitting of our critic, we can utilize the critic in order to calculate here our deterministic policy gradient and improve the actor. Once we have done that, we can utilize this low pass filter, this incremental updates, of the target networks for the actor and the target networks of the critic, and we would have one full sweep of our DDPG algorithm. And as we can see, or I hope at least you get it here from the slide, is that this is already, it's a little bit more complicated, right? So there are many steps involved. We have, uh, the handling of a big memory buffer, potentially. We have the question of exploration. We have structural decisions on the policy and the critic. Um, we need to handle target networks. We have to do a supervised machine learning step in between. 
we need to apply this gradient here on the deterministic policy gradient and so on. So there are many steps inside the reinforcement learning algorithm here of the DDPG, which can really go wrong. Why do I see that, say that? Because uh, in the preparation of the final exam, you will also get a task from us, which we are currently still working on, but we will introduce a task to you at latest in the last week, um, where the DDPG could be a potential algorithm which can solve the task, among others. And I'm just saying that, um, that if you work on the task, that um, if you are not able to see a sufficient learning curve from the very start, that this should not discourage you, but that you make up your mind that in this algorithm, many things need to come together, many things can go wrong, and that reinforcement learning is really, uh, or deep deterministic policy gradients as a part of reinforcement learning is really an algorithm where you need to ensure that all the different parts of the algorithms are configured uh, correctly, that they're fitting together because otherwise things will go wrong. Right, so let's say you have a wrong critic function here defined at this point. Of course, you need the critic here for the policy gradient. If that does not fit together, you will have a structural learning problem here. Um, let's say you have uh, a small, uh, a too small memory buffer, so that could then lead to that experiences are kicked out of this memory buffer too early, basically meaning that you will just learn very slowly out of this memory buffer because maybe you do not store enough information over time. So many things can go wrong and you really need to ensure that everything fits together. And normally that will mean just empirical try and error, right? So even if you use standard toolboxes out of the uh, open source software world where DDPG algorithm, you can just, you know, Google for any reinforcement learning toolbox out there in the world, and you will see that the DDPG is always a part of this toolbox because it's one of the big standard algorithms. And even there, if you just take a standard toolbox, you also need to ensure that all of these choices are application specific. Okay? Any questions to that? Okay, I will not bring any example on the DDPG due to, to, due to time. We will also have very nice examples from our own research in my group at the last lecture uh, in two weeks. Um, and yeah, it's really a very nice algorithm which normally converges well. And um, we will see that the TD3 is basically just a small extension to that. I think with respect to time, I will just go briefly over the TD3 uh, baseline information here, as the name already says, deep deterministic policy gradient. So that's actually the same name. The only addition which is on top here is twin delayed. So we will basically see that TD3 is an extension to the DDPG, which was an extension to deep uh, to deterministic policies in DQN. So that's basically the end boss, at least for today. Okay. Very briefly, um, where does the motivation for the TD3 comes from? Um, that is also coming from something which you already have learned, and that was, I think, in lecture five. Yeah, lecture five, I guess. And that was the maximization bias of double Q learning, right? So in Q learning, uh, where's my chalk? I have put it somewhere here. So in Q-learning, we always needed to have this max over u of q x u, right? So that's the standard evaluation for Q-learning. And we have also seen this evaluation in the DDPG, right? So where we have looked for the best possible action with respect to the Q values, and in the DDPG case, we basically got this action from our deterministic policy mu. So far, so good. The problem is now that this max operator, or now with the deterministic policy trick, that this can lead to over-optimistic evaluations of the Q values. 
Because if this Q value approximator, so if you use an approximator, for example, or during the learning process, if this is wrong and you search for the best possible action that can lead you to decisions into directions where you think that the Q values are higher, but if that is an approximation or learning error, this can basically kick you into the wrong direction, right? So this was this overestimation bias. So basically, you try to find the best possible action, and this will basically just give you a wrong hint, and then you need extra time to actually learn, ah, okay, that, that was not good. So that was this overestimation bias from Q learning, and we have learned um, this problem in the tabular case, but of course it's also applicable in the continuous action case and in the continuous state case. So therefore, TD3, twin delayed DDPG, is basically, uh, in essence, a double DQN. So basically, we use two Q networks, which will be used in a counteracting way in order to um, get rid of this, as we did it in the um, tabular case. So that's the first thing. There's also like an, um, that's a little proof basically to what we have discussed so far, but I will just skip it due to time. Um, so that was basically just the maximization bias proof that this is also applicable in actor critic, but I think that's not so important here. The main uh, issue is basically that if you use a critic, so that would be the critic, that this can lead in the actor critic approach also to overestimating your Q values with respect to the true policy. Uh, a proof for that can be also found here in the paper from Fujimoto. Here in the slides, you had like a uh, simplified version, and here is also an, um, basically just a small example from a uh, robotic hopper and walker example where we can see here the true DDPG, so basically the DDPG uh, information which you would get from uh, infinitely many samples, and then the DDPG based on uh, this overestimation bias where we can see that the estimated DDPG critic value is much higher than the actual DDPG, basically just empirically um, giving us some proof here that the overestimation problem is also valid in TD3. Another issue is that um, in the DDPG case and in the Q-learning case, that also not only the bias of the critic is problematic, but also the variance. So if I want to calculate here the Q-value uh, residual error, so the TD error, we can actually find that this TD error will add up over time. And therefore, the Q value estimate will be proportional to the variance of the future reward and the re residual TD errors. So that basically means that if I have some Bellman equation error over time, that this error will be also considering some variance of my learning problem. And therefore, uh, with this max operator from the DQN or from other any kind of uh, Q learning algorithm, that this will also lead to scenarios where it will lead to over-optimistic choices. So, the question therefore is, how can we get rid of these over-optimistic over choices? The first measure, so the first tweak in order to do so is again double Q learning. So we will have basically two um, Q learning networks, as we have already introduced that in lecture five, but we will work with a clipped version out of it. So what means clipped version? That basically means that we will use uh, the clip target. So that means that we will take two critic networks with W1 and W2. So these are the two critic networks. And in order to get a non-optimistic evaluation of the uh, critic, we will basically add here the min block. So that means in every time step, we will uh, evaluate the two critics or the two target networks of the critics and take the action value estimate, which is the lower one. So that would be like, okay, in order to be not too optimistic, we add like a pessimistic choice to it to compensate for it. So that might then 
introduce underestimation, right? But underestimation here is not so problematic than overestimation. Why? Because if you estimate a certain part of the state space or state action space too low, so the Q values are actually too low in comparison to the real ones, that's not a big deal because normally you will not stick to that too much, right? It will not throw you in the right direction. Of course, it will not lead uh, you towards that direction, but it will also not stick you like in this direction. Second part is our target policy smoothing. So what do we do here? Is basically that the, um, the actions which I will take, or the successor actions which I will take for the evaluation of the Q-learning algorithm, so which I basically plug in here, that I will take my deterministic action and during training, already add some noise to it, but then also clip this noise with respect to a lower and upper bound. So and that basically means that I um, take the actions in the learning process already with respect to some actions, uh, with some noise, and not only the actions which I apply to my, um, to my system. So that was actually your question you asked previously. Which action do we take? And in TD3, the answer would become it would be that during training, I will take basically a fuzzy action from my data, and that during application of the action, I will add another separate noise, which is then sent out to the real plant. So the TD3 has some fuzzying, some uh, basically blurring of the action in the learning case, but also in the um, decision-making case. And last but not least, we will also have delayed policy updates. So that is something which we already have discussed in the, I think, also DQN case, um, that basically what we do is that the policy is not updated every time step. So what does that mean is basically that uh, we will update our policy only, let's say, every 10th time step or every 100 time steps in order to allow the critic to become more accurate in the meantime, right? So let's say um, you have some decision-making problem and you have adapted your policy, so your decision-making algorithms significantly in one time step. So that would mean that the entire Q values you have estimated so far are inaccurate, right? Because they do not fit anymore to your policy, which you have changed. So, and these delays basically lead to um, the opportunity for the critic to become more accurate again. And then with this more accurate critic, we can basically go, no, where we have it. Yeah. Not so important. But with this more accurate critic, uh, we can then basically go into the deterministic policy gradient approach, such that the critic is not completely pointing towards in uh, the false direction. So therefore, the last measure: delayed policy updates. Only update the policy every tens or whatsoever steps, such that the critic can become more accurate as, and is not pointing towards the wrong direction. Uh, this policy update um, algorithm with lambda uh, with tau here as the uh, policy update parameter can also have a significant impact, as we can see here from this uh, Hopper environment. So that's a basic um, environment in terms of robotics, and this can basically then lead also to a delayed learning process, but it will also, of course, influence the variance of the learning process. So. Yeah, I think a very intuitive measure here, basically, that you allow yourself to evaluate your new policy over time, right? So let's say, um, again, my McDonald's or Burger King example, let's say you went to McDonald's all year long, you change your policy, you now consider going to Burger King more often, but you lack experience yet with Burger King. 
So instead of reconsidering changing your policy again in the next step, going to McDonald's all the time, what you do is you gather some experience with Burger King, you update your Q values with respect to Burger King to say, okay, after some time, uh, yeah, Burger King indeed for me is better or McDonald's is better. And then when you have fixed your evaluation, if Burger King or McDonald's seems to be, be better, then after some time, you just reconsider, right? So these policy delays basically just help you to not reconsider your policy choices too often and then basically jump back and forth between uh, decisions. The TD3 algorithm, um, I just put it here in its full color, um, twin delay TDPG, basically very um, similar to our DDPG approach, we have some differences. The first difference is here in the critic. We use double Q learning with two critics plus blurring our action noise. So we basically try to not find an action which is directly the deterministic best action, but an action which is close to that to basically regularize a little bit. And we have here the policy delay update. So if k mod kw is equal to 1, so that basically is just an if condition, basically saying that we just update the policy only if a certain number of steps has been done. So this is our policy delay part. And these are then the main changes between the DDPG and the TD3. So basically, double learning and delaying of the policy updates. And based on these changes, we could now, today, go through many different variants of these algorithms because you can see that based on this main idea of deterministic policy gradients or DD, DDPG, deep deterministic policy gradients, we can now add different variants, different ideas, evaluate them empirically. Uh, the baseline information here is that with DDPG and TD3, you have basically now learned the most common learning algorithms for off-policy learning for continuous state and action spaces. And based on that, you will see that more or less all other algorithms which fall into this category of off-policy, continuous state and action spaces, and deterministic policies, that they will be extended versions of DDPG or TD3 or some variants out of it. So therefore, basically, if you have understood this algorithm, if you or algorithms, if you have understood the motivation behind, you should be able to get behind the ideas, the concepts of all variants based on these basic algorithms. The same also with the stochastic uh, policy learning from last week. We will add some um, additional algorithms to that next week. But basically, if you have understood the ideas there, you should be also able to get the ideas of other on-policy stochastic learning algorithms as we have introduced them last week. Um, the summary, of course, you can again um, go through that in your own pace at home. Um, the base information here is that we have today combined many things which we have learned today. We have combined the DQN ideas of uh, experience replay buffers. We have combined the policy gradient ideas from last week applied to deterministic policies. We have taken old approaches from um, double Q learning from the tabular case now thrown into this continuous uh, action and state spaces. So we have basically put together today many things which we have already learned in the last weeks. And um, if you go into the literature, if you want to work with these algorithms and research, then don't be irritated that you find so many algorithms out there. Because uh, in research, there's also a certain habit that everyone which is working in the field wants to come up with his or her own algorithm, wants to get like famous or whatsoever. And what they basically just do is they take these baseline algorithms and they try to add like a little bit there, a little bit there and try to be better in certain applications, but actually it goes all back to these basic algorithms if it's a deterministic policy algorithm. So therefore don't be irritated by 
many different algorithm names which you can find out there in the field. It's not so complicated if you have understood these two concepts. Okay, any questions before we wrap up for today? Seems to be not the case. That's good. Um, then, yeah, thanks for your attention, and yeah, then see you next week. Thank you.